pulling out your philosophy in terms of how you run your businesses, whether it be sports, paper, philanthropy, who's had the greatest impact in terms of how you think? I think my parents, I was blessed to have great parents. Um, we, I grew up in a home of modest financial means because uh, I went to college on scholarship. But we were very rich in the important things of life and family values and, and code of ethics and a way of operating that really serve in everything. And I guess there was a sense of love also, well, the three Fs, I call it, in the early years, you know, faith, family, faith, philanthropy. And we did it at our level, but it was always about building relationships, which I think technology, you know, it makes things so efficient we're not doing. And because we're, we're in a world now where people are looking for leadership, <clears throat> excuse me, and people to set a tone. And, you know, I, I have this saying, I think most people like to play between the 40-yard lines. And they want people to help them. And they want to feel, they, they want to earn good income, but they want to feel that they're connected to something bigger than what they're doing. And so in our companies, we try to get that sense of family and team. And we're building something special. And, you know, I can see a little sign that my mother had up, you know, when we ate breakfast. She said, hard work, perseverance, and charity are the main things in life. And, you know, you look at people who are successful and a lot of people have a lot of talent, but who aren't. And it's usually mental toughness and preparation that make the difference. And then when the going gets rough, you hang in there if you believe in whatever your mission is. And I think in today's world, people in organizations are looking for le strong leadership, people they can connect with, where they feel the moral and ethical values are similar, but they're part of something special. And of course, so there's where family, faith, philanthropy. And then in 1994, January 21, I had a fourth F of football. So that, that came into it. I just want to touch on the faith, faith part for a minute. I don't know that faith is, is, is fully understood or fully appreciated or uh, as fully a part of society as, as perhaps it should be. You know, I'm reading that you still read with your rabbi uh, on a regular basis, Faith of the Fathers. Is your connection with faith something that's really uh, helped you with life, particularly when, when your my, wife Myra passed away in 2011? Well, that was a unique situation. I'll put that aside and I can come back to it. But I think having a sense of spirituality and I don't care what one's religion or faith or even, I guess, if they're agnostic, but they believe in some greater force. Um, because I think the purpose of faith is to get human beings to live on a higher plane than the animals in the jungle and that there's something bigger going on that's bigger than all of us, and I had the good fortune, unfortunately my dad died at a young age, but I had the good fortune of having him leave me an ethical will. And, you know, in it he said, when you go to bed at night, make sure the people you've touched that day are richer for having known you. And the other thing he said, the most important thing is to try to earn a good name um, and every generation has to earn that. It's not something that's inherited. You, you maybe get a start, but you have to earn it. And that goes, that's a function of how you treat people. And, and, and I think one's faith helps people try to live on a higher basis and, and respect for a greater authority. Whatever your detailed beliefs are, 
just getting you out of this dog-eat-dog -dog world or the things that might take you down. So. so at a young age, I had this stuff imbued in me. And, you know, I think if you take the sport of football, which I think is one of the great training grounds in life for everything you come up against. It's a team sport. It's something where you have to, if you're going to be successful, you have to subjugate your ego, put team first, and, and you know, if you win, there's so much credit and such good feeling, euphoria to go around to everyone. And if you don't win, you know, because if you haven't inspired the guy in the left, the guy in the right, to work with you, or the defense, or the special teams. Anyone can lose it for you. And the same way, it's improbable who can win it, just like our last play or next, very close to the end of the Super Bowl. I mean, no one could have figured that a guy working at Popeye's eight months ago who came up to us and didn't have a pair of cleats and, um, you know, would make the kind of impact he made. I want to go back to how you bought the Patriots. I think I have this right. You're a season ticket holder. You go in every game. The team's terrible in, in the early to mid-'80s. And your first move is you buy an option to buy a piece of real estate next to Foxborough Stadium. Then you, a few years later, buy Foxborough Stadium, uh, and then you end up buying the team. Was this all a plan or did it just happen? Well, to all your viewers, especially young ones, I say, you know, go for it and dream your dream, think big, and when things don't go your way, keep coming back. And that's the story of me trying to buy the Patriots. Uh, I knew I had a greater chance of being a starting quarterback in the NFL because there were 32 of them than owning the team in my hometown. You have New York, you know, the Mars is still there in Chicago, Pittsburgh, you have the same owners for 90 years. So I used to sit in the stands in the 70s and 80s with my four sons and think how I didn't appreciate how the team was being managed to run. And I used to be really down that our season used to be over Christmas because in the 34 years before we bought the team. You know, they had one home playoff game in 1978, which they lost to Houston. And I was there with Earl Campbell and everything. And I just said, if I have a shot at running this thing, you know, what would I try to do? And so then I tried to figure out how I could get an edge in buying the team. And there were three parts. You had the team, you had the stadium, which was a different ownership, and you had 300 acres of land around the stadium that you needed to be free on day of events for parking. That was owned by a, an amalgamation of 16, 17 people. Long story short, I went to them in 1985 and offered them basically a million dollars a year uh, to control that land, have an option on the land for 10 years, and with the option at any time to purchase it for $16 million. Because they had different things going on, they agreed to it. My banker told me I was crazy because, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, it generated about $600,000 of parking revenue. And, but I saw that as part of a control factor you know, long term. And, you know, we're taking a shot. You try to do whatever you can in any business to differentiate. So that at least gave us one leg of the stool. In 1988, the son of the owner of the Patriots um, sponsored the Michael Jackson tour. And they lost a lot of money. And eventually the stadium went bankrupt. And then Victor Kayam owned the team. And it was about $50 million of debt, or 49 or, And he bid $17 million for the stadium, and I bid 
$25 million, 50 cents on the dollar, basically. Now, the bankruptcy judge would have awarded to him if it was close, but it wasn't. And what that did is there was an operating covenant that went along with the lease that said the team must play there till 2001. Once again, my banker told me I was crazy. This is a stadium that was built in 71 for $6 million. And I was paying 25 and it's a white elephant single purpose stadium. But what that did is it gave me all the revenues associated with the team, parking, signage, uh, concessions, everything but the ticket revenue. And I think the then owner of the team had thought they'd probably move, so they didn't want to get saddled with a... And then a new owner came along, because Mr. Kayyem, I, I guess, had some financial issues. His name was Orthwine. He was part of the Bush family. And in 93, after that season, <clears throat> sorry, he wanted to move the team to St. Louis because they had built a publicly financed stadium. And I was 93. There were eight years remaining on the lease, and I refused to let him move per the bankruptcy judge's commitment. He offered me $75 million to move and get out. So my sweet wife had heard that. She said, you paid 25, they're offering you 75. Take it, you'll get another team someday. But, you know, as a young kid, I remembered when the Boston Braves left Boston for Milwaukee and that was my team. So it wasn't about money and uh, flew out to St. Louis to meet with Mr. Orthwine. Uh, I told my wife the right number. I said, we're gonna, the right number is 115, we might go to 120, 125. And I went out there and paid 172, <laughs> <laughs> which was unlike me in many ways. And that was the highest price I ever paid for any franchise in any sport anywhere in the world at the time. And it was an instinct um, that if we got a hold of it, you know, we'd have the third piece. And, you know, the games used to be blacked out. The team never sold out in 34 years. So we took on a big challenge, but it looks like it worked out okay. How different was the reaction from your sons from the reaction from your wife? My wife was very smart and a great lady and a great partner for 48 years. And it's the only time in our marriage when she lost it and thought I'd gone bonkers. <laughs> and I, and I'll just tell you a funny story because right after I did it, the next day Parcells was our coach and I'm reading in bed, it's about 10 o'clock at night and she's next to me. And he said, now, we got to sign our left tackle, Bruce Armstrong. So I'm acting like a big shot, I own it. I said, sure, Bill, what are we talking about? So he said, $10 million, four years. This is 1994, two and a half million dollars a year for, you know, so a $10 million commitment. And of course, the phone, and my, my wife's saying, oh, no. I said, sure, go ahead, Bill. I hang up the phone. She says to me, is the summer house in my name? <laughs> so, <laughs> she thought I was off my rocker, and it's the only time in our marriage that, you know, because we had to come up with money fast, so, you know, our house, everything, we, you know. We, but there are times in life when you believe in something, and you go for it, and you might never get that second chance and I'm sure you and I have a lot of friends that coulda, shoulda, woulda and when the moment comes and you got the chance you do it and you take it on and you believe in yourself and that you can do it and whatever values maybe sometimes it's false confidence but then you just work it and make sure you know that hard work, perseverance, charity, mental toughness you get your opportunity, you go for it. I thought just as risky, maybe 
even more risky at that time was privately financing the $325 million, what is now Gillette Stadium. Um, you know, some of the things you were doing at the time, like buying the steel even before you had approval because Boy, the price know. was right. I mean, all well, this I'll, stuff. I'll I tell mean, you, just, and I'd like to actually use this as an opportunity to clear something up to our fans in Connecticut um, because they made us a very generous offer in Hartford. And um, one of my sons who was at Harvard Business School, we, when we walked away and turned it down, which we had the right to do, I did it. We walked away from a billion two present value in uh, 2001. And the reason I did it uh, was I didn't think it would be good for the state of Connecticut because I knew we were moving because we, we needed a stadium to be able to keep, compete, but all our fans could still go. It was an hour and 15 minute longer drive and people tailgated. But I didn't, I want deals that are win-win. That would have been a good deal for the Kraft family, but not the state of Connecticut, because they had given us an NFL inflator. So we always would be in the top three teams in revenue. So when the new giant or Dallas Stadium came on. It would have been great. We walked away from that and committed, you know, over a quarter of a billion dollars to build it privately on our own land. I, I believe we're the only fully private finance stadium without personal seat licenses in America. The land, the stadium, even the infrastructure we're paying back. But it all goes back to my childhood and then me sitting in the stands and relating, it's like, am I gonna ask the guys who are sitting next to me for to pay for the privilege of buying a seat? Yeah, I sh financially that's the mm -hmm. right thing, but it just, I would have been ticked. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you know, thank goodness we won the Super Bowl that year and it gave us a little juice and you know things in life just you always got to do what's right for you you got to listen to every <clears throat> excuse me you got to listen to everyone and collect a lot of good advice but in the end you do what you think is the right thing to do you know there was an internet company that got the naming rights initially to the new stadium. And then of course, I think it was like 2000, 2001, you know, the, the whole dot-com industry just blows up. And at that point, were you like, this is a significant portion, this company goes into bank, this is a significant portion of the well, financing. Well, it was the bubble. Was it hard switching over to finding another well, naming Well, it was rights? just finding. We were lucky to find, but you, I'll tell you, yeah, the third decision that was probably Cuckoo, which you mentioned, we, wanted to, our stadium to have a New England flavor, and I love blue, you know, we're red, white, and blue, and the steel was blue. And we couldn't get financing, because 9-11 had happened. And we're in the ground. And we're, so there was $56 million of blue steel we had to get from Canada was shipped down. I had to sign personally and guarantee it, because we didn't have the financing, so that if we never got the financing for the stadium, I would have had single purpose steel, blue steel that the value would have been, you could melt it down and resell <laughs> it. So it was, you know, but when you're passionate about something, it just drives you to do things that you might, and that's why we're passionate about winning too and trying to win championships. So we try to collect a team and people that feel the same, same, same sense of commitment and drive and fulfillment that you get when you can do it. Because ordering $56 million, I have the copy of the letter of this steel. Man, that wasn't the wisest thing for me to do. But we would have left, we would have lost a year. And, you know, you just do things in life that, sometimes it's your instinct. I go a lot by instinct. You can. Harvard Business School teaches you to look at cash flows and analytics, but there are things, you look someone in the eye, or you see or feel something that other people don't, and you just go for it. Do you find yourself 
being pulled back to that, you know, you have an MBA from Harvard, you graduated from Columbia, and yet so much of sports is emotion and passion. You were a lifelong fan before you bought the team. Do, do you ever find yourself being tugged between the two, saying, you know, the numbers are telling me this, and, and, but, but my passion's going over here? Well, and you, yeah, that happens all the time, and then you try to have common sense, and you have to, and, you know, we live now in the age of the salary cap, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a relationship guy, so, you know, parting ways with some of our players is really hard, but it's the whole process, and it's just, in life, for me, some things just sort of feel right. They can't be explained. And I would say instinct and passion influence me a lot. Was there a point where you said to yourself I, that you were fully embraced by Boston in terms of being the owner of the team? Because it seems like early on there was some... Uh, it's almost a recalcitrant attitude by, by some of the fans there. You know, I, I go back to a story, you know, where, where Jonathan greeted a delivery man in the late 90s and, and he shows up wearing a Packers uniform, you know, deliberately, you know, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, had to do with some business decisions that were made outside of football, I think with some mills or something like that. And, you know, there you are turning the team around and it's not fully accepted at that point. Well... I think the fans accepted right away because we hadn't sold out in 34 years. And first day, it was announced on a Friday. That's Saturday. People kept saying, thank you, what can we do? I said, go buy season tickets. And 6,000 people came and lined up on a snowy day. And we sold out that first year, and we've sold out great since. So the fans related to our family. I think some of the politicians who had other agendas or what they, you know, the night before I made the commitment to Mr. Orthwine to buy the team, I spoke to the then governor of Massachusetts and said, look, I'm going to have to move fast and commit a lot of money. We're going to need a stadium in downtown Boston. I want your commitment that it's going to happen, which I got. And then, of course, you know, things have a way of changing and not. So I really, I mean, think about it. We've had the privilege of winning four Super Bowls in the last 14 years. And we've had between a million and a million and a half people come to the city of Boston within 36 hours. And the last one, I mean, we had mountains of snow. So I no, I've actually what, what inspired me and made me feel good about the financial risk was the fandom. You know, when you buy a team, you look at your balance sheet and, you know, fan support is basically zero. It's carried on the balance, but it, for us, that was the hidden asset, that I was one of them. I knew the passion. And if they felt they were getting a fair shot, how they'd support us. and. The fans of New England have given us amazing support and haven't been fair weather. Now, we've done pretty good, too. Uh, but for 21 years, you know, we have a waiting list of over 60,000 people. Have paid. They pay to get on. And what we do is people, if they have season tickets and they want to, they can't go to a game, they go on our team website and we sell them there at face value. And, you know, we've built up a tremendous following with our fan base. What have the four Super Bowl titles by the Patriots done for the brand? Well, uh, for people that like winning, I think it's helped. Um, but we notice um, we have tremendous sponsors, and I think it's also allowed us to expand our fan base nationally. I know wherever I go in the country, um, and even, believe it or not, we do a lot of business in London. We've been there the last, two of the last five years, I guess. And um, it's 
been a good experience because those two games, I think we won 80 to 14. So maybe it's because it's England and we're New England. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, our product of the NFL is such good entertainment. It's made for television. It's the number one appointment television product that, you know, I think, and, and I think the league has done a good job attracting women. 43% of our fan base are women now. And when they get in, you know, it's, well, look at this Super Bowl, which is the most watched program in the history of television. So we just feel it wherever we go in the country. People want to talk to us about football and the Patriots. Do you get to the sense where it's uh, a little more challenging now to do an economic balance? In other words, you're getting more sponsors because of your success. Uh, so you, you've got this Optum Lounge now at, at Gillette Stadium. Oh, but, 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 but at the, on the other hand, you know, you've got season ticket holders that are saying, hey, you know, I, I don't want to be moved. I don't want to be moved. I mean, seriously, is, is this something that, you know, well, you, you think Well, it's something we lot? take very seriously, and I think we've, treated our season ticket holders. We've been good to them and they've been good to us. Like I said, we've had no personal seat licenses. Um, and um, it's always a balance there where you're trying to put your franchise in the place where it generates the revenues, where you can do the things that allow you to compete, whether it's getting the right personnel, the right coaches, and the whole environment, because in this age of free agency, you know, you players have a choice where they want to go, and especially in our business, being in the Northeast, climate isn't a big seller for our tax base and our climate. So we we have developed a little development around the stadium, close to a million and a half square feet, called Patriot Place, where we have. 14 restaurants, uh, we have uh, some medical buildings that we're the local community, but even our team can service there. And, you know, we have bowling alley and a lot of entertainment uh, as well as retail. You know, I think one of the most successful Trader Joe's is there. And so it's a balance, but it's a place where players can come hang out at our facility and then go to Patriot Place and get everything they need, like a, a little, small little world. And spring and summer and fall especially, it's great. Was this something that you did also to, to get your family nervous again at financial risk? So I'm thinking you picked probably, what, the middle of the dive in real estate to, to, to build this thing? No, when we planned it, real estate was humming. We opened right around 08. Um, so um, it was like when we were trying to finance our stadium was right around 9-11 when everything, you know, so our sense of timing hasn't always been great, but things have worked out where we work a little harder and try to connect it to whatever is appropriate at the time. And we've created a whole little village there. there were, it was an underserved region, you know, between Providence, Boston, and Hartford. And, um, it, you know, we have medical space there and the entertainment. And it's, you know, think about it. I told you we privately financed this. So when you build a stadium, and we have about 20,000 parking spaces where, because our fans, once again, we were, we knew what they wanted. They come three to four hours before the game and stay one or two hours afterwards. So it's a truly a day of entertainment and connectivity with their friends or family in ways that they don't have in today's world. But after those events, we have all these parking spaces. So when you're doing a development, usually the biggest issue is how do you get enough parking to support so we had the parking for free, 
and then we didn't want to do personal seat licenses. We knew we had to try to generate revenues to support our operation. So we went out and took the risk, and then we had the debacle of what happened in 08, but it forced us to make some tough decisions that have turned out very well. Financially, is Patriot Place something that uh, is going to be a financial success in part, made possible, I should say, by the Super Bowl victories? I really think it's independent of that. It has nothing. It's an independent business that stands on its own, that services, you know, 12 and a half million people with an hour and 15 minute drive. And really, the people who come are looking for what our retail and our entertainment opportunities are there, independent of, yeah, day of game or concerts or events. Well, in some ways, it hurts because there's not parking for the customer, so it's a balance. But all in all, it's a good integration of assets. You've mentioned the success the Patriots have had in London. Do you think uh, it'll be long before the NFL has a team based in London? I, I, when we played there the first time and I saw 85,000 people come, and at the time, if you go back and look at my interviews, I said, I think there's a real chance the team could be here before the end of the decade. And we're getting up there, so. Uh, no, I, I definitely think, I mean, the biggest issue for us is the logistics of how it would work with the whole NFL. Uh, but, I mean, we have three games this year, and, you know, the tickets sell out as a package, 85,000. And it's great because it expands the reach of our game. And I don't think we've done a good job explaining the game to people. Um, <clears throat> and actually, I use my sweet wife as an example. She never cared about football. She actually liked it. I took my four kids on Sundays and she'd do the Sunday crossword puzzle the times in ink and then see the chick flicks that I never and we were gone you know all day at the stadium tailgating and everything and then I committed all this money and she knew nothing about it so she started reading and going to games you know and then she realized how intelligent you have to be to be a good head coach and the strategy and how intelligent the players had to be and and you know that taught me that we've not done a good job with women but with fans new fans if people understand our game they will buy into it because it's it's life and it's it's something you can connect to and i think you know the development of fantasy football just shows you know how people can use the analytics in the game and develops a whole new audience and we need to find a way to do that better globally. What about football in LA? Uh, do you think that will happen before a team in London or perhaps after? And, and my, my whole thing is if you build it, if you get teams in LA, you're probably going to see a privately financed stadium, you know, just looking at the 49ers. So I'm thinking two teams. No, I think, I think those of us who love the NFL and look long term know that we need teams in LA and to have 20 years of no teams there where young kids are growing up. Now, it's been good for us because we have a lot of Patriot fans um, in LA. Part of it is Tommy being from the Bay Area and the team being good and so, but it's not good, you know, our family, please God, is in this business beyond the grandkids so we we need we need teams in a great venue with great ownership in LA uh, there's so much to do there and the weather is so good that to compete we're gonna have to have top facilities but I think it's a great place to have Super Bowls and a lot of things around it besides the family ownership two most important keys to all the Super Bowl wins 
have been Coach Belichick and quarterback Tom Brady. Do you ever think about, well, you know, these guys aren't going to be here forever, and what am I going to do to prepare for the day that they leave? No, I never thought about it. <laughs> yeah, I would think about it all the time, and, you know, God forbid you have accidents, things can happen. So you always need to think about contingency plans. And But, you know, part of going back to that breakfast snook with my mom and dad is hanging out with good people. And get, the key to life is surrounding yourself with good people of integrity and character. And even if you sacrifice on brains, people you can count on that they have enough intellect that you can count on. I, we happen to have the two best at what they do. So it's in my interest to do everything I can to keep that going for as long as we can. And that's my intent. And, you know, we try to have contingency plans for everything, but you hope you never need them. And um, I think we have a system in place and, you know, we, we've been going for 21 years and, you know, I, I mentioned to you we had one home playoff game, which they lost in the 34 years. We've had 20 home playoff games in 21 years and we've won 20. So, you know, I think we've tried to organize it in a way, 10 championship games, that's almost one every other year, so I don't know that we can keep that going, but we hope so. How do you and your son uh, work together, or, or perhaps a better way to put it is play off each other? Because I always think of Jonathan as like, you know, when I talk to him, he's really intellectual, almost like a tech geek at times when, he, when he's talking about things. And you've always struck me more as a guy, you know, who's uh, learned more from street smarts and, and you know, working uh, in, in the paper industry and so forth. It, it seems to be quite a contrast there. Well, I think we're really quite similar. Uh, we just have different styles. You know, I made sure all my boys worked in our factories um, and joined the union and, you know, put the hard labor in so that they got a feel for what really goes on in this world. Um, uh, Jonathan is very capable, works too hard. I don't know how many fathers would say, you know, you, you need to take some time. And, you know, he's a great family. His family comes first, and then, you know, he's just dedicated to our family group of companies. And, you know, he's pretty special. I'm very lucky to have him. With so much revenue sharing in the NFL, I mean, over half of the overall revenue is shared equally among all the teams, does it still pay from a business standpoint uh, to be a consistent playoff team, to be a team that wins Super Bowls? Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, we've been in two Super Bowls where we've lost, and that one and done, and I know how the Seahawks must feel. Because we, but when you're privileged to win a Super Bowl, it just enhances everything. And your fan base feels good. I don't know, we sold 20,000 championship hats within hours. I mean, just people want to be connected, and it makes them feel good. One of the things, the only time I can recall reading anything where you seemed angry was in the midst of this whole deflate gate controversy. And, and you were quoted in the paper as saying something to the effect, you know, I, would, I want an apology from the NFL if this comes out that we've broken no rules. Um, how would you characterize yourself during that whole situation? Well, here we are going to the Super Bowl. And we, just that term, I mean, this is about supposed ear pressure in footballs. So you use a term that takes you back to Watergate. I mean, you know, it just, here we're trying to get ready for a game. This is a complicated situation, and I think the facts will come out. 
I spoke to our key people, and I, I think it was pretty important that we keep the focus on the game, the team. And I wanted them to know I had their backs, and we were all, and I wanted the world to know that we're a unit. And sometimes, well, let me just leave that. I was upset, um, and I don't, I don't get upset very often, but here we're coming into one of the greatest periods that you work so hard to get there with training camp and all the little things that can go right and wrong and it's so hard to get there and it bothered me that outside factors that a good chance we had nothing to do with could take over and influence one of the great few moments that's very special so it was my job to get up after doing the homework I did and just make sure, you know, make sure everyone understood where we stood. And in this whole age of social media, you know, and people leak things out like it's the truth, and then it takes on a life of its own. And uh, I mean, it was ridiculous. These stories were leading news. People were being beheaded, Japanese people, by ISIS. And this, I just, it's about supposed air pressure in football and the, just the terminology, the whole thing. And that's, that's just the times we're living in. So you have to understand that, but doesn't mean you have to accept it. You said to me, the first conversation you and I ever had, is that, uh, and I think I'm getting this right, you said the choice of one's spouse, and I was single at the time, is the most important decision uh, one could ever make. And um, uh, I've since gotten married, and I, I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> it worked out. But uh, uh, after your wife passed away, I got a sense that you were kind of like lost, that you had kind of felt robbed. Um, how did you survive that, and, and, and how do you feel today? Well, that was the most difficult thing that ever happened. Um, you know, you lose a parent, and it's devastating, but it's part of life. I mean, I had a, the greatest wife, you know, and why, you have a good memory, and I do believe that, because if you're a family person, you have kids, that's, you know, in the end, your kids are your legacy um, because the values you put in them a hundred years from now will matter and how their kids and grandkids impact the world. You can be worth $20 billion today and it won't mean anything a hundred years from now what you do, but the values what you put into your kids and grandkids. So, and, you know, my wife was my partner and best pal. And, you know, marriage is difficult, so you have to be back and forth and respect and treat each other as equals. But if you found the right woman, it can be the most rewarding thing. So my wife, except for delivering five babies, never was sick, never went to the hospital. You know, she weighed 98 pounds, she read four books a week, she worked out. So I had done everything in my estate planning around giving her financial independence from the businesses. I always thought she'd live 20, 30 years longer. And when she got ovarian cancer and passed it, I think, my kids felt I was in a depression. They didn't think I was going to make it. And for a year, I didn't date or anything. And then I met a young lady who was just great and started seeing her. And life is for the living. And you want to make sure you're not hurting anyone. But then you got to lead your life. And I never wanted to do anything that would have been disrespectful to my wife or her memory, so. 
Are you as hungry today to win another Super Bowl Absolutely. as you were before we the first? We want to be the first team, please God, in the history of the NFL to have two back-to-back -back championships. So Super Bowl 50 is our goal to get there. And, you know, but our real objective every year is to make the playoffs. And if you make the playoffs, then you get a chance. You know, I remember 96, our first Super Bowl, we thought we were going to have to go up to Denver and Jacksonville went up there and beat them. And then Jacksonville came to our place. And then we went to New Orleans in 96 and Desmond Howard made it a bad experience. But, you know, there's just so many things that can happen. But, you know, you want to get in a position that you're in the hunt and you have to make the playoffs. So the best way to do that is to win your division. And I think, I think we've done it 16 out of the 21 years we've owned the team. What do you see as the next phase for the NFL in terms of overall growth following these huge mega TV deals? Yeah, I think it's trying to build on the solid partnership with our players and then the whole digital media space um, and finding a way to keep younger people coming into the game at a young age and having more women and global global expansion in a way that doesn't hurt the quality of our game. What do you want your legacy to be as the owner of the Patriots? Well, that I care about our fans and that uh, winning and serving our community, using the winning as a way to do philanthropy that had no bounds. And I'd like to try to have the best one-loss record while the good Lord lets me be on this earth. And when I hired Coach Belichick, I said that to him. That was my objective. And I was knocking out his time at Cleveland. It's the last few seconds of the Super Bowl Seattle's making its way down the field. What's going through your head? Well, I thought Malcolm Butler's tip was great on that big catch by Curse, and, and then I saw what happened. I just shook my head, and we're thinking, are we going this way again like the last two Super Bowls? And then, you know, Malcolm made his play. It was hard for us to completely see because everyone started going nuts and then we had to get down on the field but it was one of those great moments of redemption where you're you're getting low <laughs> and then you know everything the whole all the hardships of the year flash through your mind the highs and lows and then you get to that point and then you know you're going down and getting that trophy in a magical moment that is what it's all about. And it's so elusive and so hard. So I just thank the good Lord that we were in that position. What would be your message to young people who have the aspiration to be a success, uh, whether it be in sports or in business? Well, whatever it be, it be in arts, humanities, philanthropy, creativity, is dream their dream. And then you don't want to be looking back 20, 25 years and said, I wish I had done it. Don't be afraid to fail. Because I can just say from things that didn't go my way, I learned a lot and built upon that to move forward and have mental toughness if you believe in it. Just be like the tide, keep coming back. You know, you go out, it doesn't go, but keep coming back and, and don't give up. And then the most important thing, like you asked me 
I told you the most important decision that I thought. Surround yourself with good people. It sounds simplistic, but I'll just tell them, and I'll finish by saying how I hire people. Number one is integrity, character, and loyalty. That's the first thing. The second thing is work ethic. And then the third is brains. You can hire brains with lawyers, consultants, but you know, having, and when you want to build a team in anything, philanthropy, business, sports franchise, you need people who have integrity, character, and loyalty that remember. And that's how you put team first.